there's so many motorcycles that are just styled yeah. to look great and this you know like the aerodynamic bits i assume are functional and that in itself makes it look good to me well that's i mean i guess that's the nature of styling is that you know it is the exercise of just style and um in this case though there was an aesthetic i put on everything um, we had very very little opportunity or time to do styling it was really focusing on the packaging to deal with the aerodynamics and the biggest thing is of course moving the radiator to the rear of the bike and trying to balance the pressure between the front of the bike and the rear of the bike and that you know that takes volume and area balancing the air pressure yeah Okay. between the front and the rear of the bike um, that's in fact how you address aerodynamics if because so, you have equal pressure there'd be no drag ideally yeah so we have uh, significantly higher pressure in the front and significantly lower in the back and the faster we go that gets uh, more extreme and it's much more costly to overcome that front pressure that high pressure in the front so we're trying to reduce that high pressure and um, elevate the low pressure in the back and you know, there's, you want to do that as direct as possible. And you have to be careful because sometimes you start doing, going down these paths to a goal, but it would be easy to add as much resistance or friction in the process of trying to balance the pressures than it would be, in fact, benefiting the bike. So, you know, it, it's, there's, um, I think it's a good step in the right direction. There's further work to do. Uh, it's not easy dealing with it and also trying to put as many batteries in as possible because batteries are relatively dense and opaque. And what I just told you about balancing... Air-wise, they're opaque, you're saying? It just, yeah, air-wise, they're opaque, but just they're, you know, they're just a dense, solid, opaque material. And you're, so you're trying to shove as many things that block the air into the bike as possible while still maintaining air through the bike. So there's obviously some conflicts. Yeah. Huh. That's, it's funny to think of doing aerodynamics by just trying to make the thing transparent to the uh -huh. air and right. equalizing pressure That's right. versus, you know, making it slippery or what people normally, like, ultimately you're just trying to equalize pressure and make the thing invisible. Well, invisible or transparent is a word that I used a lot when I was designing the bike because when the rider's in one position, you know, the rider's dynamic. And so if you were just going to Bonneville and you had the rider in a fixed position, you could really build elements around him that tried to equalize the pressure or streamline the bike, whatever you want to call it. But in road racing, the minute he sticks out his knee or slides off the saddle or drops his head, everything changes. Well, if you, what I didn't want to do is present new barriers or new walls when the rider was out of position. So that's why some of the things have kind of, you know, the wings have different looks. So when the rider's in the right spot, it's good. When he opens his knee, that wall, we don't present anything new. We simply maybe lose the arrow benefit, but we don't add additional arrow drag. And you're shielding his knee? No, when he's, for example, in the rear. Yeah. When he's all tucked in, the rear and the wings and all that makes sense. When he slides off to go around the corner and he slides off the seat and he's opened his knee up, if all that would have been um, here, let me walk oh, you let me you me. you lose the wing is all. Well, you lose the wing, but what's more important, you know, if this was a typical streamliner, this would be all solid through here. This would be all solid through here, and when the rider's tucked in, it all makes sense. But as soon as he slides and opens up his knee, you would be presenting new walls because he's no oh, longer blocking. Sure. Him. Okay. So what I wanted to do was not add any in, through his normal dynamics, not add or present any new barriers to arrow. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, like if the wind is now hitting this, it, this sort of shape that might be his like his butt or something would be here in a, I see yeah. what you're saying. So, I mean, again, in this case back here, the best example is when his leg's there, we try to take off the leg, return the air to the lowest pressure um, in all these shapes. When he opens up his knee, we still, we've probably lost some of that ability, but we haven't presented any new surfaces. Okay. Any new resistance. That makes sense. So that's why it looks like things are kind of attached and whatever, but, um, and I think that's also why it doesn't have that kind of uber um, potentially integrated look that I could have given it. But then we would have introduced a lot more perpendicularity or a lot more new high pressure. Okay. So, and 
it, it looks like from the stickers and from today that you guys are partners with uh, Dissolt and SolidWorks or sponsored or something. Yeah, we have a great relationship with um, we're beta testing software for them, talking to them about you know what companies like us and what the real needs are and what we'd like to see in the future. Okay. And uh, it's so far been very, very successful. And, you know, motorcycles, I, I was thinking about the cars are getting so bloated, but since motorcycles don't have safety standards, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure they have consumer CE, whatever, certification, but they don't feel bloated. But even so, does SolidWorks help you trim down pieces and optimize things with, you know, FEA or whatever? Well, the, the biggest thing is um, these are actually extremely complicated machines still. And you really need, you know, a competent CAD package that allows you to at least package everything as dense as possible. Uh, density is a big deal. Um, this whole where we apply the mass for motorcycle handling is a big deal. So you really have to immediately go to a 3D software program to even be in the ballpark. Once you um, start the process, then yeah, you continually refine it and use some of the things like FEA and um, CFD and other um, components that SolidWorks offers. Okay. You know, to continue to, to evolve it. But it, it would be impossible to really do what we did just 20 years ago, which was use simple CAD programs or even hand drafting. I mean, you could hand draft this, but uh, it would be almost impossible to, I mean, it would take years. <laughs> and you'd communicate, you know, you, by the time you are done the drawings, you'd be outdated. So there's just a speed and efficiency of uh, using the CAD packages like SolidWorks that if you don't have it, you're not competitive. It sounds like it's easy to express yourself in SolidWorks then. If that makes sense. Like to... Not always. I, th I would say that's actually the difficulty. Um, in the old days when you were drafting, typically the person that was... Um, when you communicate to your team, you also do so through sketches, and sketches isn't a big step away from drafting. And so um, you could actually have an influence as the creator on the actual documentation. Right now, there's a big step between what I do in sketches and what the guys do in SolidWorks. I don't do the modeling. So I have to now communicate all those ideas to somebody else. Um, so it's a little bit harder, I would say, for the, for the, the leader or the visionary person um, to express themselves. But once it gets handed off the team, the team can do a phen phenomenal job because you don't need necessarily um, people that are good at, you know, well, you don't have to have artists. <laughs> you can actually be a very good engineer and have good SolidWorks skills and be able to yeah, express yourself or render really high quality parts. Did you use SolidWorks to design that battery? Everything. Everything on the bike has been designed. Every motorcycle we've done and every part on every bike has been done in SolidWorks. Motorcycles are notoriously bad aerodynamically mm -hmm. um, and it's important, especially important with batteries since so much of your effort is just moving the air out of the way. Yeah, uh, somewhere in the 90% category, that's a lot. <laughs> People don't, must not think that. No. They always think it's weight and stuff, you know, like this bike is so heavy, probably can't go that fast. Well, certainly to accelerate and decelerate um, consumes or absorbs a lot of energy. But someplace like at the Isle of Man or, you know, on the freeway or wherever where you're just kind of sustaining speeds, at that point, 90% of your energy is going just to simply park the air. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah. So why wouldn't that be a priority? Um, I can work on the thing that's you know ninety percent, or I can work on the thing that's ten percent. Yeah. Yeah, like O-ring chain or whatever, or a non-O-ring chain. Other drag. Yeah. Um, so is there a wind tunnel in SolidWorks? There is. It's called um, CFD. Oh yeah, right. Computer fluid dynamics. Okay. It's a simulated wind tunnel, but, um, and you know you still need both, but most people are able to do more, quicker, better. Uh, I would say everybody is able to do more, quicker, better with the simulations. And I know of companies that actually have half-size wind tunnels that have decommissioned them and put the energy towards their CFD packages because that's where the It's a lot of effort to run a wind tunnel. 
It's a lot of effort to run in one tunnel. You actually have to have a really good test program to make things relative and repeatable. Um, humidity, air pressures, all those things have an impact. And you have to have, create parts to put in the wind tunnel. We have to make real parts. Yeah, yeah, right. So now <laughs> you, you have to make every, every idea. Right. And, you know, just to say, well, you know, there was some cardboard and scissors and tape. I mean, you can, but then, you know, how accurate can you reproduce that when you leave the wind tunnel? I mean, you're, t you're talking about fine stuff. I haven't thought about this. I, I knew in college everyone was always going on and on about CFD, but it's almost sad. Wind tunnels seem so romantic. I know. They are. They're very cold, though. <laughs> if you're uh, a rider or you need to simulate, you know, obviously the motorcycles, we have to put the riders on. So oh, yeah, I've been in the wind guy. tunnel. It's quite cold. <laughs> but you have to find some special, like, one-quarter scale rider. <laughs> have a sun or something. Or, you know, have one tunnel, I guess, where it's warm. But You mentioned being able to move the radiator. But uh, with with an electric bike, what other, aer what other aerodynamic luxuries are you afforded? Well, no uh, exhaust system and particularly no muffler. Okay. And if you look at what's happening now... Um, with motorcycles, um, particularly street models, you know, mufflers are significant and they are extremely unaerodynamic. So not being able to have that is, a, is certainly a benefit. We also don't have an air box or an intake box. So some of the ideal locations for the air intake that would benefit the motor, we can use to just benefit the air of the bike. Okay. Those are all pretty significant. As far as the the speed equivalents for what other type of motorcycle it might match up to mm -hmm. um and the range uh how is it at this point in time well I, I mean we i can tell you at portland which is our home track which has a nearly uh, one mile long straight it's over three quarters of a mile so pretty decent straight um this bike is able to keep up with the latest 1,000 cc's as far as the top speed and acceleration. So That's remarkable. It is remarkable. It's, it's unbelievable. And the, what's more remarkable than that um, is it doesn't feel like it. When I'm on the bike, I feel like, oh, that wasn't a very good lap. And I look down, it's like, geez, that's two seconds off what I can do with my Aprilia RSVR. Or it's a top speed faster than I could do with my KTM RC8R. Or it's equal to the latest Ducati that was next to me. and. It, and you're just it doesn't feel that way it doesn't cruising feel like, along and right and so what happens this is what you want uh, to the, the number one goal for me as a motorcycle designer is to make the motorcycle feel like it's going slow to feel like it's in so control and there's no extra drama so the rider himself feels like okay I can go and try to find another one percent or half a percent or something you can't do that when you feel like you're on the edge of being uh you know uh, losing traction or being thrown down or being high sided or whatever you everything has to be perfect and in order with no drama and then you can yourself um, elevate the entire you know performance of the vehicle so when we're basically maintaining 1000 cc speeds yet it doesn't feel like we're we're doing that the you know the, the sound the vibration all that which is exciting also is distracting yeah and wears you, know, you out it, it it consumes some part of your mental ability there's no doubt in my mind you can say oh it's it's all in the background i downshift i don't use any energy well you you you, you probably don't think you do uh consciously but subconsciously there is a small portion just call it two or three percent of your brain that's still doing these mechanics if you can all of a sudden apply those that two or three percent something like corner entrance oh are you uh, initially i thought you were talking about nvh but it sounds like you're mentioning also the like not having to consider gear so that's part choice. of it so just the whole thing i'm saying the whole experience um it's much like simpler and refined yeah i mean like. and so you would say oh god well who wants to ride that you know who wants to ride a simpler bike well don't worry you turn around and, and make it again exciting by going faster so the, you know the riders will always go to their maximum and the question is what's occupying their um ability to do their maximum is it superfluous dexterity functions or is it just focusing 100 percent on line corner entrance speed yeah and corner exit so we'll always go to our 100 percent ability yeah because like with a peaky 500 cc gp bike or something like half of your effort is just taming the power band exactly 
or waiting or strategizing when I can get on or cracking on the throttle so I can you know, soften that next, uh, the initial blow or dragging the rear brake while I'm cracking it so I can clean up the exhaust system so then I can get the, all these things. They're doing all this and this was so, so incredible about racing um, and motorcycle ra racing in particular is that, you know, that's the genius. But if you could grab that same rider and say, here, I'm going to take, you know, three or four of these items or five or ten percent off, off your plate or off your mental processing and give it back to you, what do you want to do with it? They're going to apply it to speed. So yeah, ultimately, uh, a simpler bike will be a faster bike. Are there other control layouts you've experimented with? We have, um, not a lot. We're, in, you know, the the we have enough on our plate, and it's hard enough to get people to um, maybe take the electric component serious or or just you know understand where them. we're coming from on that and a lot of that has to do with gyroscopic forces and and other stuff but um so we're, we don't want to reinvent the motorcycle for the sake of just reinventing it um the you would think that possibly the front brake is not in the best location due to the fact that braking and throttling is something that is the relationship is so tight there's in fact no dead time between the two it's one or the other all the time and so to put that on the same hand probably doesn't make the most sense but at that point, we haven't experimented with moving that. What we have experimented, though, is rear brakes uh, at the left hand and other stuff, which has been really, really successful. Okay. So I think there are some things, and we've got next year you'll see uh, some new controls coming um, that are not on current bikes in current locations that we're pretty, you know, we're ready to add. Motorcycle control layouts are terrible. Mm -hmm. And looking forward to seeing if, if that gets changed around, at least on race bikes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's hard though because you know it's hard enough going just from street to GP shift, back and forth, and uh, you know a thumb brake or something is added. That's kind of a that takes a long time for somebody to get used to. You're so, you know, again, you're you're going at at a level that's so high. You don't want to consume a lot of the energy. Do I shift up? Do I shift down? It needs to be automatic. So yeah. it's not easy to make these changes, but we're definitely moving that direction. Have you guys thought about movable aerodynamics? Yeah. Um, I would just say a little bit, not a lot. Movable aerodynamics, I think, are probably best when you're trying to um, utilize aerodynamics for downforce. Okay. We do not and have not designed and trying to avoid any downforce in the bike. That would be just added drag. Yep. So I would say I haven't yet come up with a solution that I think would be beneficial more than the extra weight or complexity that the movable components would add. How does the coefficient of drag on this compare to another bike of your choice, like uh, uh, your RSVR? Yeah, I can't, I can't tell you that number right now because we didn't design that bike. It's not in our computer. Oh, okay. This bike is in our computer. Um, and unless we were to take them both and do back-to-back -back air tunnels, um, which we have some air tunnel data, um, but... I don't have that exact number for you. What I what I care about right now, first of all, I'm in. I am interested, and we are going to do that. But what I do care about right now is, is there an improvement over our previous electric bike? You know, and can we go faster, or can we maintain higher speeds with less current? And that seems to be, um, uh, you know, an absolute yes at this point. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's probably slipperier and you're making well, progress. Well, I, so. I can tell you from riding, you know, the bike that you had just mentioned, um, when I move my knee in or out or when I'm slightly out of the position of, of ideal, um, it's barely perceivable. I can perceive it, but it's barely perceivable. On this bike, I absolutely can tell. I mean, I'll go and something doesn't feel right and I forgot that, oh, yeah, I didn't move back the extra two inches that I could in the rear seat so I could get my exact elbows. and stuff. I mean, you're in the right position. It's freaky quiet. You just touch your knee out or move your elbow out or lift up your anything. It's really, the noise goes up significantly. So um, it's like something I've never experienced or any of the riders that have ridden on the bike. Yeah. That might, that also could be, I mean, I think a lot of it probably is the, the arrow, but it could also be that it's so, like the rest of it's sure. so quiet. Absolutely. Yeah. So 104 at this year's TT. Yeah. Actually. Um, Something that people, most people don't know is that up until, I think it was um, Ramsey, which is two-thirds of the way around the course, we were on a 120-mile-an-hour lap. 
It was unbelievable. Now, anybody can do that. Two-thirds of the way. Yeah, yeah, you know, right. Mugen could have done that. Anybody could have done that. But he was on that and still finished the race. So uh, the other thing is Michael was pushing very, very hard at the beginning, having to do that he was first out of the box. He didn't want anybody, he didn't want anybody to catch his draft. Oh, okay. Um, and there was also some track conditions. As you know, this year was damp track. Um, and there were some areas that he felt he could optimize uh, better and uh, ran a really smart race, but 120 mile an hour lap. I don't care even if we couldn't finish. Wait, that, so that's the, a no joke lap. Top guys are like 129 or something, right? On, the, on the absolute flat out record's 131. Yeah. Most riders are between 120 and 130. So that's right in there. It's with the best of the world. I mean, it's amazing. So, uh, again, you know, and that's with a bike that. Honestly, we have still probably less track time than even though we've been there three years. Each time we go, we get you know one lap or three laps usually per rider per year. So we still have maybe like you know Rudder has maybe six laps on the bike. Miller has had a couple of that didn't complete, so he's maybe up to six, maybe he's eight to nine laps. That's it. Honda does eight to nine laps over a two-day period because they've got multiple practices. Yeah. And those riders can go out and do three or four laps or five laps. Gas gets more practice. Yeah, so, I mean, when you think about we've got Rudders on, was on his sixth lap ever. Yeah. And he was at 120 to Ramsey. It's pretty, that excites us. Yeah. Because we know what, you know, God, if we didn't, if we could do this better, if we could do this better, if we could get more time, if we could get the rider more comfortable, if we could, you know, still the tires aren't quite right for the bike. I mean, there's so many things that we're still off on. Are you using traction control or other electronic aids? So next year we will have... And I don't like to talk about the future bikes um, before it happens because it's our competitive edge. Okay. But we have a, uh, we will have a Modus's ECU or what we're calling an SCU, which is a Modus's system control unit, an overall control unit, um, which up until now, most of the electric bikes have relied on their inverters to do most of that work. We will have a separate box specifically for all the sensors to go into all the strategies to be deployed from and then all the commands to come from so this should significantly elevate um, the programmability and our control and also our advantage because this will not be uh, anything that anybody else can buy and it's in development right now so obviously your bikes have been very successful but the reason they exist is to market your electric drive company to potential clients is that correct yeah and we've got most of those, you know, deals in association or through the racing, or we're able to at least illustrate. Um, maybe in a certain number of years, we won't have to, or we, you know, we'll have so many other vehicles on the road um, that there'll be potentially other and better ways. Um, but, you know, I'm a huge motorcycle nut, and um, I think it's one, it's justifiable, and it's, uh, I think, quite effective. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it seems great. Um, and the irony is that this, that the you know this bike has kind of set, um, I would say, a certain standard that other companies, um, you know, have contacted our previous employers, and um, now this bike's DNA is in, you know, at least in the other two leading bikes. Uh, race bikes as well, which is, I think, fortunate for the entire industry, but obviously it's difficult for us. Yeah, right. It's flattering, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, so people are using the exact same, you know, have gone to the exact same inverter partners or have used, you know, virtually identical cooling by, you know, trying to hire or, or hiring our previous engineers, um, going to the same, um, you know, mo many of the same solutions. So um, that's where it is, and that's why we have to now do more things proprietarily in-house and keep a better control of the IP. Um, yeah, that actually, yeah, that's sort of a bummer if you like have a gentleman's agreement, and then they're like, oh, by the way, you didn't sign anything or, or something like this. You, you know, gentleman's agreement aside, people, are, uh, people have different character, and so some people, uh, uh, some people maintain, uh, most of our employees would absolutely maintain that confidentiality. Uh, some don't. On my old 900 SS, I have a lithium phosphate battery that weighs 2.6 pounds compared to the 10.6 pounds uh, of the lead acid battery it replaced. It's remarkable. And, yeah. and that was the first 
sort of sign of battery technology that I saw when I thought, oh, I have to completely recalibrate my head about what a battery is. And that's a, a generation at least older battery than we're using. Yeah, that was my question. Like, how how special is the battery, or or how ex where is battery technology at the leading edge now? Well, I think it's in these. I absolutely think that the leading edge of batteries are in these electric motorcycles. Um, and Dow Kokum, uh, I still believe, has the best battery in the world that you can get. Um, what what's that company? Dow Kokum. Dow like like Dow, Dow Chemical. Okay. And Kokum, which is like Kokam. Um, Korean American okay. combination. Oh, okay. So, um, if we were racing electric cars, maybe you could, you know, say, well, we have extra room, so energy density is not as high a priority. Or if we were doing street motorcycles, you could say, well, power isn't as important, so power density isn't as important. But on an electric racing motorcycle, <laughs> you need the highest power and energy density possible. And those are in contrast with each other. So, you know, I think this is the leading edge of battery technologies in these bikes. I've heard a little bit of talk about electric airplanes. Mm -hmm. And from what you're seeing and what you think about the future of batteries, does that to you seem like it would be a possibility? No. I mean, it's a possibility. Yeah, Any, sure. Anything's possible. Sure. Is it practical? What I, I just flew in, you know, last five days, I've been on three flights. Um, Thank God none of them were electric. <laughs> it's not that it's not possible. It certainly is. Um, but there is an energy density in combustible fuel that is, you know, uncomparable, compar uncomparable to anything that we can do in electric batteries. So it just doesn't even make sense. I mean, you could almost make the same argument for a, a, a motorcycle. And, that, and at this point, I would say, you know what? You're right. Your argument wins. There's no reason for that bike to exist. But what's happened at our company in the last four years, because we've been trying, is we've taken bikes that could, you know, barely compete at any level, barely could finish a lap, to now bikes that are accelerating as fast as 1,000 cc's. That's only in four years. We wouldn't have got there if we didn't try. The thing about the electric airplanes, you could say the same thing. Well, let's try. And I'm all for trying. There should be people out there experimenting and doing work. But to me, at, the, at this point, we have a... If, if, if we could conserve oil consumption in, in standard areas like commuting, where performance doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. You just need to get to your point and get home and do it safely and enjoyably and whatever. Um, if we could change those um, habits, we would have then you know, enough oil for the foreseeable future to, to reserve for things where it doesn't make sense. Like in, you know, I want to actually get on a jet that's supersonic, not that's electric. I want to get from like the trip I took yesterday. I could get here in 30 minutes if it was supersonic, as opposed to the or you know, a little over 30 minutes as opposed to the four and a half hours it took me, the normal route. Yeah, I agree. Like so many people are in, like half of the gas burned in by American commuters is in V8s or something and, like and this. And like idling and doing like 20 miles in sub. Right. <laughs> It's and ridiculous. It's, and like, if, if you look at the road, you would never think there's a oil crisis. Right. You know, it's exactly. like, you guys. So what you have to do is, you know, it's, we have to be sensible and go after, like I said, in the case of the bike, we go after the big chunks. The 90% was arrow, so we went after that. Go after the big chunks. Go after the things that are easy to fix, the things that aren't going to really affect anybody negatively in their lifestyle. An electric commuting car isn't going to have a negative adverse effect on usually the commuter. It's going to have a hugely positive effect on oil consumption, on independence, on environmental. These things are just practical and they're obvious. To me, the biggest changes in, in batteries will most likely come from charge rates anyway, not energy density, and you can't recharge an airplane in flight. I mean, you could change other batteries, but if, 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 you know, if charge rates is where the future is going to be in the batteries, in the car it makes sense. You pull up to the gas station, you charge up your battery, it takes one or two minutes, the same as a fill-up, and you're on your way. Um, so I think that's where we're going to see most of the battery improvements come from. Are there other things that are on your mind or on the tip of your tongue about this bike or SolidWorks? No, it, you know, I think it's cool that um, large companies like SolidWorks, which has had a huge influence on small companies like us to actually realize some potential in some of their dreams. I mean, 
It is, it is never a discussion in the office, or it's barely a discussion in the office. When a part is drawn, is, well, how are we going to model this? Or how are we going to communicate this to the CNC machine? It's, that's, that's resolved. They've, they've fixed that problem. Um, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it was an issue. What kind of set of prints are we going to do? And how is the, you know, the machine that's going to interpret these prints? And all? we don't have those discussions anymore. So what that does, just like racing, gives us, you know, back 5 or 10% 10, 10 of our mental capacity or our budget, time budget, to apply to things that are either more innovative um, or more beautiful or lighter or stronger or whatever. So it, it's pretty amazing that we get to live in that time frame. I mean, you saw there's a printer out there in, in the um, lobby, and I truly believe that a lot of uh, people in the future will be able to print um, high-performance parts at their local shop or at home for their own bike. You go to a catalog, instead of ordering it and having it shipped from China, whatever, whatever, that, that order will just simply go down to your local parts store, it'll be printed out, and the next day you can pick it up. Uh, in metals as well. So. Um, this whole connectivity of you know basically the digital realm in this whole process is huge and and to see companies like SolidWorks actually kind of even embrace small companies I mean you could have Ford here and you could have I'm sure Volkswagen Group and all of that um, but it's pretty cool that they think that you know uh, potentially their biggest sales and their biggest growth is trying to kindle the the startups and making sure that those guys are moving forward and and have access to the same tools that the biggest companies in the world have. I think they like the wings. <laughs> you know, like, if there's some Ford here, this thing's really exotic, and it can be, and if there's some Ford, it doesn't look like they're pushing the limits of solid work. Yeah, exactly, right. So, it's, I mean, you're right. This is, this is well, and awesome. We, and we push the, 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 the limits of SOLIDWORKS maybe differently than Ford because Ford simply has more people, more resources, and can take time. Or we don't. So the, the program can't be an inhibitor. It has to be a, an, 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 an enabler. Yeah. yeah. It's a pretty cool time to... Uh, it's a pretty cool time to be involved in motorsports or transportation when we have this chance of seeing you know, the biggest change ever in our lifetime, maybe the biggest change ever since the invention of the car or the motorcycle, um, and being able to have a hand in that as a small company. That's unbelievable. I understand that you can put together a really high performance battery, clearly. Um, is there enough of the rare earth elements or that kind of stuff to go around? Well, the thing is, um, my understanding on the lithium, which is the biggest, you know, most exotic component in the battery, is uh, there's significant amount of lithium. Lithium is a, is a very plentiful material. The batteries are also 100% recyclable. Um, what apparently is more rare is the rare earth magnets. Um, that are in some of the electric motors, but they don't need to be in all the electric motors. And some vehicles benefit from having the neodymium batteries, uh, sorry, uh, ba um, magnets, and others don't. So again, it's you have to look at you know where do you put a two-stroke, where do you put a four-stroke, where do you do a diesel? Okay. And hold on, what was my other question? I mean, I guess that's it. The only other thing that I just guess that you asked me earlier what was also on my mind. Um, I think it is kind of interesting that this is one of, this is like our, our third or fourth generation carbon fiber frame. And we've always had carbon fiber frames, but we've never looked to the carbon fiber frame for lateral flex. We've always done that with the front end. And we will continue to do that with the front end based on the tests that we've been running over the last several months. But this iteration um, also relied on some frame flex. and. We seem to have very good um, response and able to get the, the, the amount of lateral flex that we want out of the carbon fiber frame. So I know right now it's, you know, this is getting a bad name. You know, carbon fiber frames are, are a disaster, or not the, not the, you know, obviously with Ducati's issues. Yeah, right. Exploding. <laughs> yeah, but um, Shattering. I, I believe that it's, a, you know, it's an incredible material. And we'll see most of the bikes in the future uh, that actually go to a composite frame. 
So there's a lot of stuff going on in this bike that hopefully trickle down, even if it's not specifically electric. I have a question about carbon fiber longevity. Most historic machines are made from steel, uh, and Maserati bird cages and Vincent's are still raced today. More recent machines, for instance, F1 cars from the 80s on and John Britton's famous V1000, are made from carbon fiber. If you're racing a V1000 today, you're relying on a 20-year-old carbon fiber frame. Do you know how carbon fiber ages and what will happen to these machines, and particularly your bike here, in 30 years? Well, this particular bike, I'm sure, will be sitting, you know, done and retired and uh, probably... um, you know, we've been retiring a bike every single year. So this particular one is the one that won the Isle of Man this year. Uh, might come back as our kind of um, upgraded version uh, uh, next to a completely new bike. Um, but after that, it won't be used anymore. So that's where it will be. I, I, meant, but, I meant more about aging yeah. and how the strength yeah. stays. I, I can't answer that, but I can tell you where, where we are speaking to. And this next, actually this month, we have several um, meetings in Portland from a large group um, that I can't talk about now that's an international group and they'll be bringing people in from all over the world. Specifically for that, we're really into um, uh, sensors right now. So I can't go into lots of detail because it's something that we're commercially working with another company on. But it is an important element. Not only is the, how does the carbon fiber age and uh, what is its characteristics as it ages, but also if you tip over the bike or if you overstress the bike or, or overstress the carbon fiber. So, for example, um, you know there are carbon fiber wheels, but they're not used in or allowed in most race um, sanctioning bodies right now. And the concern was because if somebody tipped one over and there was a small surface scratch, does that mean does that deem the part no longer strong? You know. And it depends, where's that, that scratch occurring at a high stress point? And does the stress riser start at that scratch and propagate? Um, and we have a lot more knowledge on magnesium or aluminum. Aluminum is aluminum. I mean, I know there's a bunch of variations. If you get a chunk of billet, For the you, mo- you yeah. know how the scratch will act. Yeah, when you, exactly. And, you know, so there are more um, uh, historical data. And so if wheels are our concern, Obviously, so would frames and so on. Um, so this is something that we have to get, I think, to really make the um, sanctioning bodies and the racers and just the public at large comfortable with moving to not just carbon fiber, but other composites, other man-made materials at, that will be, uh, you know, in a structural. Remember, but, you know, you can still get crappy metal. You can still get bad aluminum. Yeah. I mean, there's quality, just because it's aluminum, just because it's billet, uh, also doesn't mean it has the same density all the way through. Um, there's plenty of metals that come from some of these other countries that are not the same metal that we can get. Same grade. Are you making all your parts in Oregon? Yeah. 90% of the parts of the entire bike are actually made in our shop. And do you make the motor? Uh, the motor, we have a partner, and, and two of the components come from our partner. Um, and then, But the motor is our motor, our design. Um, and really what comes down to that is is how it's packaged, how it's cooled, um, how it's characterized, and so on. So, But there's, a, there's two components in the motor that are quite complex and expensive to tool up for. And we've got a great relationship with Remy on those and so they make those components specifically for us Uh which is not unlike every other car company in the world I mean they usually have partners at some level you you don't do every component inside and your your wheels aren't that streamlined does it matter well I can't exactly answer that Um, there's an issue of I mean, it'd be easy to sit here and look at the bike and say, oh, you know, fill in the wheels and do this and that. Like if you look at, for example, maybe a bicycle, time trial bicycle. Um, but also, yeah. time trials bicycles don't have full discs in front and back, and they typically don't have a front disc, and that is because the lightest of, wi- of crosswinds. Um, if you think about streamlining, particularly on a motorcycle, it is, in fact, the same as an airplane wing 
vertical and because obviously it starts at a point it's going to come to a point and there's going to be some amount of acceleration over that that's going to create some amount of um, low pressure and some amount of basically lift on an airplane or in our case you know sucking the bike one way to the other well when everything's lined up and you're headed directly into the wind or there's no wind everything is equalized on both sides but as soon as you get a little bit of a side wind you have more air coming across one side than the other thus greater lift to that side which moves the bike one way or the other if you can see that in a motor a bicycle doing you know that's only doing 35 miles an hour you can imagine how much impact that has on a motorcycle that's doing 135 or 170 miles an hour so we have to be careful about what we do arrow add apply arrow to and at this point i wasn't comfortable i already felt we were pushing the the slab sides enough yeah and wasn't comfortable adding any more particularly to areas things that could turn easy like the wheels yeah i think ferrari maybe in the 599 xx they were injecting air out of the tail lights or something like this or where the tail lights would be is air injection feasible or useful i, I think it would be uh, to, i mean obviously if they're putting air into a low pressure area they're reducing that low pressure by adding air if they're doing it mechanically that's a lot of systems we could never justify adding those systems to our bike but we're trying to do that exact thing, um, I would say, uh, passively, with just allowing air to get there. So, you know, sometimes um, we have little holes or little vents where you think, oh, you'd want to seal that off. It's like, no, we actually want to be able to, to let that low pressure draw air out. So not in some cases, we're not necessarily pushing it in there, but we're allowing air to be sucked out of there. And if that can happen, of course, you again, you're, you're reducing your low pressure. I guess you want to have laminar flow over the whole thing. Maybe have, or like vortex generators well, people use. I was, I was going to say laminar flow, yes, but maybe not because you can never maintain that position all the time. And then if you, how do you, when it gets disrupted, how negatively is the disruption impacted? And if you had vortex generators or something which, which basically at least disturbed that so your laminar flow didn't separate too e much. Exactly. Uh, then maybe you're better off. I have to tell you that this is uh, extremely... Um, complex and this is our first step and I think it's a bigger step than maybe anybody's ever taken and I hope we look back in a couple of years and go that was such a joke <laughs> you know that was such a poor attempt but good thing we started and and this is the result of it after two or three years of work you know we don't get to work on the arrow every single day we we get just like this bike we got to work on the arrow for maybe six weeks before you know we had to do the fairings so we'll get back into that, and we'll have taken what we've learned when we get that opportunity again. And we might next year, well, I can't talk about next year's bike. What's it like riding with that throttle and that throttle response and without gears? It's perfect. It's, it truly makes the other bikes feel antiquated. It's, you know, it takes a while. You don't get this perspective day one. Uh, or certainly from a, as a bystander. There's no bystander that walks up to that bike and says, oh, that's, that's going to be the future, that's a better bike than the gas bike, without having some insight. You have to have some insight on why you would say that. And the best insight, of course, is spending time with them and riding them. The first time I got on the electric bike, you know, I, I had no passion for the electric um, drive systems at all. Uh, the bike was heavier, it was far slower, there was no benefit. The throttle control wasn't as good, engine brake, nothing. Well, what do you expect? It was the first bike. And I had just got off of a bike that had been in development for 50 years. Not a really good comparison. Uh, four years into this, I still appreciate the gas bikes immensely for the things that are exciting to me. I do like the downshifting, I do like the upshifting, I do like the uneven torque. Uh, this is why it's fun to wheelie at times. You know, I like the clutch, I like to back it in. You know, all those, all those fun things that we got to build around the tools, um, or basically maybe the deficiencies of the bike. You get on this bike, and I have a extreme appreciation for how fast you can go and how slow you. It feels like you can go, and that to me just allows. I, I just see uh, how much these bikes can improve over the next couple of years, and I, I just. You know, it truly is a more zen-like experience than a gas bike. If you want to go fast and you want to feel speed and you want to feel like you're acting upon speed, you're asking for more speed um, and controlling that by degrees of percentages, 
uh, it, it can't. Nothing comes close to an electric bike. There's lunch if you guys want. Like okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and you, uh, we can go get lunch too. Uh, but as far yeah sure. Uh, with engine braking, do you tell me once more about the engine braking setup on this? It's open. It's whatever you want. Okay, and, but it's adjustable. It's beyond adjustable. It's mappable. It's individual. It can be done on the fly. It can be done through our our um, new system control unit to be connected to other parameters. And is it the same with acceleration too? Sure. Exactly. Yeah. That's nice. exciting. Exactly. <laughs> you could almost imitate <laughs> another bike. Yeah, that's, you, that's you can do whatever you want. Um, okay. Hey, well, thanks so much. I know that was probably yeah. longer than you were. Well, it's for. all right with me. I'm sure you have too many words, and I'm sure the readers don't want to.